Professionals have standards. Be polite, be efficient, have a plan to outdo everyone you meet. So today we're looking at a professional 3D printer and I'm gonna try and find out how it's better than just a decent consumer grade machine. This is the Dagoma Sigma Pro 500Z from France. Dagoma has actually been around for a while and I always find it really interesting to check out how smaller companies end up doing things differently because they can still really innovate when they don't have to sell millions of units and squeeze out every last penny of margins. But I'm a bit cautious here because there tend to be two types of professional products out there. The first one is where you invest a little more and you get a top level tool that is gonna pay for itself. If you're using it for your job, this sort of stuff is just a no brainer. This is the good kind. The other kind of professional is the one that greets you with RFQ. That basically means their prices will be made up on the spot because the seller knows you're not calling them because you want to use their product, but because you have to. If you could, you would definitely use something else, but for reasons outside of your control, you don't get to make that choice. The more desperate you sound, the more their prices are gonna go up, but their product doesn't actually get any better for it. Dagoma publishes their prices, which is a good sign. This one is a flat 3000 euros with tax, which isn't even that expensive in the realm of pro level 3D printers. But also, what even is a professional 3D printer? Well, only one way to find out, right after a message from today's sponsor. The Moose is 3D Maker Pro's newest generation of handheld 3D scanners. Get up to 30 micron accuracy and full color scans in an easily usable package. The Moose skips the need for tracking markers and produces consistent scan results with the new AI model repair built right into the free JM Studio software. The Moose comes with a stabilized main camera and now supports rescanning. And if this all sounds great, but if like me, you just need a scanner that you can use to grab geometry as reference for CAD, there's also the very affordable Moose Lite, which just has a slightly lower resolution and skips the color scanning features. You can get an extra $15 off the Moose with code TOMSD15 at the link below. So I honestly really don't know what I should be expecting from this. This is from a small company, but it's also pro level graded. So I'm more expecting that this is gonna be a reliability and, and sort of workhorse focused machine than one that does all the things all the time at like the highest end. One of the big features of this machine is that it now has power failure detection. And I think that sort of primes you for what level of features you're getting and how much they're focusing on reliability, I guess. Accessories, we're gonna get to those in a bit. This printer is actually available as a dual extruder configuration, or at least they're saying it's optional dual extruder. I think this one has a single extruder. Well, there's two filament intakes. Not sure what those do yet. This is a lot more lightweight than it looks. I think this one's upside down. 3D printed flexible feet. Look at that. There we go. That's the bottom and it has custom 3D printed rubber feet. That's, that's kind of cool. You will notice that this printer is actually using quite a few 3D printed parts. So the entire housing of the, this is a, a color touchscreen, is printed the low level printer firmware interface uh, that's also printed the tool head, oh yeah, this, this one's still sealed, is also printed the extruders on the back. Extruder, I think, one. Also printed, and again, this is just something that makes sense at a low volume when you're not making millions of these units, then printing and being able to iterate quickly is something that is worth much, much more than, you know, savings when you're injection molding parts in the mills. Let's have a look at the inside of the machine here. I wonder what this, uh, these panels are made of. Must be something with the words D and Bond in it. And then this one is uh, acrylic PMA. That's a cute little bed down there. <laughs> okay, magnetic spring steel bed. That is the print size that you get. So that's built grip that they're calling it, um, which I'm assuming, yeah, is really just, no, it's two-sided. Okay, that's cool. So PI on one side and then build grip, whatever that is, on the other. And then there's no tool head in here. So that must be in the accessories boxes. Not really sure what this is, but it looks like some sort of packaging helper. I don't know. Power cord, I don't know what that does. Ooh, there we go. So these are injection molds. So I'm not sure if they make these themselves or if these are off the shelf parts, but 
These are these feel like a, a fiber reinforced nylon or something, and they're magnetic. So these snap into the into the axes like that, and then you attach the effector onto them, which should be in one of these other boxes. You get a little spatula, and then a couple of alcohol wipes, an 8 gig SD card, a USB SD card reader. This one looks kind of cool, and another printed part which. That's supposed to be that way. We're gonna find out what that does. I, I feel like that's also some sort of a setup tool. And we're starting to run out of boxes for the tool head to be in. Also, I'm, I'm missing some sort of a manual. So I guess that's gonna be online. What are they including here? Steel nozzle 0.4 for technical filaments. That's French. Yeah, interestingly, their entire website is uh, in French. They don't have an English website. You have to use Google Translate to even figure out what you're getting. Again, that sort of tells you how small of a company they are. So that is the tool head, one of the tool heads. So steel nozzle on this one, that's hardened steel, I assume. Um, with what looks like a copper block. And this is all also FDM printed. And it's a fiber reinforced, probably a carbon fiber reinforced material here. Two fans on the top. That is a, a cool idea. So you have two of these little, I think these are 25 or 30 millimeter fans. These go all the way past the hot ends down to the filament cooling ports. The part cooling fans essentially is, is what these are. And then it has a little extra fan in the front that just cools the hot end. And this looks like a yeah, fairly standard hot end but not one that I've seen before. So this is some sort of custom job built like a standard E3D hot end, essentially. Oh, and a little clamped thermistor. Okay, so no thermistor cartridge. These tool heads go to 350 degrees Celsius out of the box. However, the heated bed only goes to 80. That is a bit of a weird combination because all the high temperature filaments, um, like polycarbonate or the, the high temperature nylons, those also need a high temperature heated bed. So let's see if the fully enclosed build envelope helps with that. And then this is just the exact same thing brass nozzle for PLA filament, both 0.4. That's an interesting choice to just include two full tool heads just with a different nozzle instead of giving you an extra nozzle to swap out from, you just get two complete tool heads. And this is also printed from, you know, what feels like ABS or ASA or something. I guess that sort of indicates that it's the lower spec version. You know what we should do? We should probably get this out of its wraps. This is sort of bothering me that it's just sitting there like that. Ooh, that's a smoky gray. Okay. And these are all also, ah, okay, that's static. These are all partially pre-peeled where they attach stuff. Ooh, that's a silkscreen printing sticker. That's painted on. That's sort of raised, looks kind of cool actually. It's kind of interesting that this printer has two screens. Um, so we've got what looks like a six and a half something inch screen, six inch screen, and then a smaller two inch screen at the bottom. This is, as I understand it, a basically a Linux system, Raspberry Pi or something. Um, and this does networking and all the high level stuff. And then down here you have the classic click wheel and the reset button and a much, much smaller screen that runs the actual firmware. So the SD card goes in here. Anything else hiding at the top? Oh yeah, it looks like one more peel. Ah! That's just a straight hole. I thought there was gonna be some sort of a filter in here, but that is literally just, that's just a honeycomb. So I'm guessing that they did plan to put like a, an activated carbon filter in here. And I think on the website, they're actually showing you um, that you can install a fan outlet up here. Let's see what we get on the SD card because I do wanna have some sort of a manual to assemble this. Okay. Uh, this SD card is completely empty. You don't even get a sample print. That's interesting. So I'm just gonna use best judgment, which you guys know my judgment is always very good, to assemble this thing and, and just see how it goes together. Where is the plug? Where do I plug this in? Where do I, where do I plug this in? Where does the filament go? There are slots here and here, and those just go straight through to the back, uh, to the extruder, and this box that also has what looks like a little Bowden fitting in here. My guess is gonna be filament goes in here, and then filament comes out the top. Actually, before I plug stuff together wrong, let me, let me just see what the internet says, if they have a manual on their website.
the website doesn't seem to have any manuals available, so I'm just gonna go by best judgment and, and pluck stuff in, starting with uh, the back here, which has this little pigtail. I don't know why that's not plugged in from the factory, but it's literally just the electronics box with a power supply going down into the main compartment. Also, I'm noticing there doesn't seem to be any filament holder included with it. On the website, they're showing like an external filament pedestal, essentially. So yeah, I will be reaching out to Dagoma about like what the expected uh, packaging contents is and whether I did this right. There is an extra plug here that looks like a stepper motor plug, but this one is sealed off. That is a very interesting solution. So instead of a second extruder, they're giving you a second filament switch and a fitting. Not sure what that's about. So tool head just goes in like that. I'm also wondering whether I should just plug it in and then the touchscreen would guide me through this, but I don't know. I don't want to plug it in completely unassembled and it's not gonna hurt if it's already plugged in the correct way. And then two more. Okay, that's in place. And then I'm just gonna plug this in. That feels very locked. And then you seem rather short. That is a very unfortunate spot to put a plug. There's three in the back. Okay, so with a little nubbin in the front. There we go, okay. And then that looks like that goes in here. Okay. Huh. So many printed parts in here. Like all this stuff down here is just it's completely printed. It's kind of cool. You go in the back here. So yeah, let's just turn this on. Oh, 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 ooh. Stuff's happening. Okay, so this one flashed me with, with Marlin. Marlin something something, which is good. Now you may be able to see me getting a bit worried here because the main screen was actually booting up entirely in French, which would make it quite hard for me to use. Thankfully, that is easy enough to swap over to English. And aside from a couple of quirky translations, everything was usable. But what was gonna be a bit hard to fix was the mint temp error that the Harden was giving me. Now, usually a mint temp error is hinting at a broken electrical connection between the main board and the Harden thermistor, but plugging in the default Harden instead of the high temperature one, everything seemed to work. The more I was using this printer, the more questions I started having. So I decided to call it a day and instead reach out to the Goma for some answers. We now have a manual, so we have unboxing instructions, how to plug stuff in. We figured out what the orange pieces are. Those are actual belt tensioners. The other thing that is quite interesting is that this display up here is actually Octoprint based. It's just displaying an interface, a local interface on top of Octoprint, but everything behind it is just standard Octoprint and you can use it as such. They also mentioned about uh, this hardened steel tool head not working out of the box. Apparently you can reconfigure or reflash the Marlin firmware through the Octoprint interface. And then it's gonna set up the firmware for you and make sure that that works. But for now, we're just gonna stick with the brass nozzle. Interestingly though, if you go into the manual, this is exactly how you're supposed to install the filament guide and the, the extruder. This other box here, I don't know what this does. Um, there's no mention of it in the manual anywhere. I also discovered this conveniently finger-sized hole on the nether regions of the machine. Looks like there's a fan on the other side, but there's just nothing on this side. Let's just go ahead and install the PEI and build grip platform. Mm. Uh, the build grip side is a bit of a finer structure and it's, oh yeah, it's a build tech, a build tech clone. The PI is coated, powder coated. That looks wrong. That looks better, okay. I guess I can just butt it up against the rods in the back and then in the front it's gonna snap into place, but I would like some alignment here because it's, it's actually, it's overlapping. So I guess I need to align it with the front here somehow, like that. Okay, now it's aligned with the edges of the magnetic sticker. Now, right here, I noticed that the Goma had chosen to put this huge aluminum plate between the round bed heater underneath and the round print area up top. But since this aluminum plate extends way past the edges, what tends to happen is that it just acts as a heat sink and cooling fins for the edges of the bed. So I pointed my thermal camera at it and it's actually not that bad. It's actually pretty okay. The difference is about five degrees between the hottest and the coldest part of the print envelope. Octoprint disconnected. Uh, connect. 
Ah, okay, there we go. Can I plug this in while it's powered up? Shouldn't be an issue. You have to kind of reach through the rods and the belts. Okay, temperature is reading correctly. Next up, calibration. Let's see if the auto Z leveling works. Z offset, analyze. And if I press on the nozzle, then okay. We have to reread it. 1044, still the same. Okay, that's that shouldn't be the case. Where, where is the FSR actually? Is it in the build plate? We just press down here. Ah, it's in the build plate. Okay, so the nozzle itself is completely static. Axes home. Okay, first moves. That's some noisy bearings. And then the next step is down here on the Marlin menu. So this is the full delta geometry calibration. Oh, and they have that. Why does it not click if I move? I have to turn it fast to even get it to move at all. And then we just do the full auto calibration. And it's gonna try and figure out like how long each of these rods and how far apart the bases are. So it's gonna repeatedly dunk down on the bed. There it goes, so the FSR is working. So an FSR and a load cell are very similar in what they do. They basically just sense a force. The way they do it is a bit different. Well, it's, it's way different, uh, but in essence, this just detects when the nozzle is physically touching down on the bed and when it's exerting force, the same as a load cell in the tool head would do. And with that, it's time to get a print started on the Dagoma Sigma Pro 500Z. But aside from not including a manual, the included SD card also does not have any sample prints on it, so we're gonna have to slice some ourselves. For that, Dagoma are providing Cura by Dagoma, which is a, their custom version, which is, you know, simple enough to use. Um, they have all the presets for their machine. Unfortunately, this Cura version does not support the networking functionality that's built into the Sigma 500Z. Only Ultimaker Cura with their profiles supports that. But what is pretty much immediately apparent is that this is old, old Cura, forked from legacy Cura. I would like to print this cone in vase mode without the solid base, but all the settings are locked away. You only get the presets. You get vase mode, that's cool. You get three different infills, three layer heights and supports or not. Like, there's no way for me to use Cure by Dagoma and remove the bottom solid surface. I don't know about you, but that feels very limiting for a professional machine. So we're just gonna do one print using uh, the Goma Cura and then we're gonna go for the full Ultimaker Cura next. But switching over to the full Ultimaker Cura actually ended up happening faster than I was expecting because for some reason the Goma Cura exported a file that was broken and just had the printer heat up and sit there not doing anything. Next up I had to adjust the Z height because the built-in calibration would leave the nozzle way too high and it didn't actually get any grip on the built tag equivalent build surface. And once that was figured out and I finally had some good G-code from Ultimaker Cura, I got some random hot end jamming issues. I would load filament into the hot end and sometimes it would go in fine, sometimes it would get caught. Um, but whenever I would start a new print, it was just like that there was something in the hot end where the filament couldn't pass by. It was like there was a little lip that was getting caught on. I tried a cold pull, which didn't really fix anything. And ultimately it just started working. And with the machine now doing its thing, I just did a couple prints, tried to get a feel for the machine, and uh, yeah, ultimately ended up comparing it to the Mark IV as well. Okay, so this is the second time I'm recording this outro because I'm still very much struggling with this machine. This time, I wrote myself a script though. So, what flavor of professional is the Dagoma Sigma Pro 500Z? Well, you know, to me, at the very least, a professional product needs to have something that makes it a better choice than the cheaper consumer level alternatives, even if it's just for that one niche where you simply have no alternatives. The only thing I see with the Dagoma here is the build volume. 500 millimeters tall in one go? Uh, yeah, there are simply very few machines that can compete with that. But you afford that one feature with so many trade-offs that make the Sigma Pro 500Z just a, an incoherent experience. This is one of those situations where the whole is barely the sum of its parts. There are some individual aspects that are good features, but then they don't mesh with the rest of the machine. Some stuff I can gloss over, like the dual display setup um, that is mostly redundant. I just ended up uh, ignoring the top screen and using the bottom Marlin screen. Or in the same way, the dual slicer setup where you can either use the dumped down Dagoma Cura with profiles and 
that integrates with the uh, built-in Octoprint setup, or you can switch over to Ultimaker Cura that gives you access to any real slicer options that you would expect from a Pro machine, but it doesn't integrate well with the machine itself and you have to manually copy paste the files for print profiles around. Print speed is slow, excessively slow for a Delta even. This build plate full of keystone wall mount plates, uh, I needed these for some networking stuff, these took over 12 hours to print for just what you see here. And they all warp to a point where they are barely usable. The same plate of parts on the Mark IV was done in under two hours and the parts looked much better and they weren't warped. In fact, they're all usable. By the way, uh, getting the print speed up on the Dagoma is probably going to be a tough job with a motion system that is this wobbly. Yes, these are full length, unsupported smooth rods. And also, yes, it does matter for a Delta. And then print quality, when the parts stick properly, it's, it's all right. There is quite noticeable Delta artifacting, but overall it's consistent, it's usable, it's perfectly fine. What I really don't get though, is why there is barely any documentation. When I unboxed this printer a couple weeks ago now, uh, there was nothing. No unboxing and assembly instructions, no quick start guide, no manual, no troubleshooting guide. And at that point, these were already shipping to regular customers. In fact, this unit says it was built in 2023. Now there's at least a quick start guide that will help you make sense of some of the machine's quirks, but it still requires that you are somewhat experienced with setting up machines. But if this was a machine you bought to get your company into the 3D printing game for the first time, with all of the stuff that I ran into, it, it would be at least frustrating to say the least. I still don't know which side of the build plate, whether I should be using uh, the built grip, built tag like one, or the textured PI for which filaments. I just used the built grip for PLA, that's what it came with. Um, and sometimes it barely stuck at all, like with these, and sometimes it stuck way too well. There's still parts of this cone left on the plate that haven't come off. Some of the headlining features seem a bit arbitrary. And this is where the lack of direction becomes apparent. High temp toolhead with a hardened nozzle built right in? Yes, but it only has an 80 degrees Celsius heated bed and the build radius is so small that you'll be struggling to lay engineering parts flat. It's cool that it's enclosed though, um, but there's no, no active heating in here. Power fault recovery? Yes, but only if you print directly from an SD card uh, on the bottom Marlin screen. Uh, the top screen with Octoprint, that might break at any time when it's not cleanly shut down because it's not using a read-only image. The printer certainly does look the part, even if it's at the expense of usability. Uh, for example, this uh, front door opening is kind of too small to get the bed in properly. And many of the printed parts look best from about two meters away. Also, these screws that are sticking out right here, uh, they are right where your fingers are gonna be when you grab the build plate. And yes, they're sharp, they'll cut you. I figured that out the hard way. You know, I think there are some worthwhile aspects uh, to the machine. The unique tall build volume, you know, this. Building it on open source software like Octoprint and Marlin. Using tons of printed parts everywhere on the machine. Uh, the printer's looks, but I think it would be a much better machine overall if the Goma picked a smaller set of features that work together and then built a printer around just those features and made those as good and as usable as possible instead of doing a bit of everything uh, for what feels like just having to check all the boxes. You don't have to check all the boxes. You can totally make a machine that is a specialist and that caters to a target user group and those users are gonna love it. You're a small company, it's no shame to make something for a small audience. Maybe I'm missing something and I'm still misunderstanding the whole professional thing. Let me know in the comments below what professional means to you and if you're using professional equipment, why did you choose it? Also, what else do you wanna see me do with this machine? In any case, thank you to everyone who is enjoying and supporting this sort of small audience content. I mean, 3D printing YouTube videos, that's just as much of a niche that I ended up in and somehow a ton of you are actually enjoying it. You can support the channel on Patreon or through YouTube memberships or simply by watching, sharing, liking the videos. If you do, thank you. As always, keep on making and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.